tips for self-directed IRA real estate landlords 2023. Hey everyone, Adam Bergman here, tax attorney, and founder of IRA Financial. On today's podcast, I want to review and actually dive into some very important tips that real estate investors, especially landlords, need to consider for 2023 based off the macroeconomic conditions that are impacting us today and that will likely continue for the coming year. So we all know um, what's happening end of 2022. We're in a period of high inflation, high interest rates, and an investment market that has been depressed, uh, to say the least, right? Almost every asset class has gone down this year from traditional equity indexes, S&P 500, which is down you know, around 18 or so percent, NASDAQ, you know, stock exchange, Russell 2000, cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all down 60 plus percent, gold, silver, even down, tech stocks getting crushed. Really, the only things that are doing well are commodity stocks like oil and other commodity stocks. Everything is getting crushed. Okay. But you know, real estate is held up relatively well. It has. Yes, prices have gone down. There's um, still some inventory, not as many real estate deals, but prices have not come down um, nearly as, as much as you know, equities and cryptos and other alts. Um, plus, obviously, real estate investors have a pretty big cushion since there's been such immense real estate asset inherent growth in the last two to three years, right? So we definitely have a way bigger cushion today than we did back in, in 08. So I don't expect that we're going to go into you know, a real estate tailwind and have a crash like 08. Just people, investors, whether it's residential, commercial, just have too much built up equity into their assets. But landlords, there are things that we all need to consider. I'm a real estate landlord. I have a self-directed IRA asset real estate asset that I own that I rent out. And these are things that I'm starting to see that I'm sure all of you are as well. Number one, obviously <laughs> expenses are going up, right? Taxes, we all know. Maintenance, right? Repairs. It's gone up considerably, 30 to 40%, I'd say, in the last couple of years, right? Just finding someone that's willing to you know, do electrician work or plumbing work or uh, just general basic uh, improvement work has been tough. Hard for them to show up, and then their fees have been outlandish. I mean, really, thirty to forty percent more than I paid two to three years ago. Okay, so that's kind of the, the really the topic of today's podcast is: Hey, you're a lender, you're looking to buy real estate in an IRA. Here are some tips to consider uh, before doing so. So, number one, why do you want to buy real estate in an IRA? Well, it comes down to deferral, compounding return, right? When you buy real estate in an IRA, you don't pay tax on any of the income, the rental income, or on any of the gains that you would make when you sell the asset. Whereas if you use personal funds, you would pay um, tax on any rental income, ordinary income tax, and either short-term or long-term capital gains on any sale of the underlying real estate, plus a potential for depreciation recapture, you know, which is taxed at, at, at a higher capital gains tax rate. So yes, you do not get deductions, when you buy real estate in an IRA, right? Because you're using tax exempt funds. So of course the IRS is not gonna give you a corresponding deduction when you're not paying tax. So that probably is the, the detriment, um, or I would say the downside of using an IRA or form to buy real estate is you're not getting the, the deductions or other pass-through deductions from your real estate, assuming they're active and they'd be able to offset other um, income. Uh, but Overall, what people want to do is they want to use their retirement funds to diversify. They want to invest in hard assets, hedge against inflation. Uh, and obviously, they want to invest in, in assets they know and trust, like, like real estate. That's why it's become probably the most popular alternative asset. So obviously, you can use cash to buy real estate, which is um, in, a, in a retirement space, probably very common. Why? Because if you use leverage, meaning a loan, to buy real estate using an IRA or 401k, there's two things to consider. Number one, the loan must be non-recourse. That's a loan you do not personally guarantee. Why? Internal Revenue Code 
section 4975C does not allow a retirement account holder to personally guarantee an obligation of the IRA, meaning you cannot take a recourse mortgage where you're personally guaranteeing the loan. Hence, the loan must be non-recourse, which you know, brings in, obviously, more risk to the lender means you have to put down more than 20%, generally 30 to 40%, and generally higher interest rates because the lender is taking you know, more risk. The second item to consider if you're using a non-recourse loan to buy real estate is this ugly four-letter word, which you've heard me talk about if you've listened to my, any podcasts or videos over the years, is UBTI or UBIT, UBIT, UBTI, Unrelated Business Taxable Income, Unrelated Business Income Tax, which is an ugly, ugly tax that rears its ugly head and triggers a potentially maximum 37% tax rate when an IRA uses a non-recourse loan to buy real estate. So simple example, you have 100K in your IRA, you buy an asset worth 200K, a real estate asset, you borrow the additional 100K from a non-disqualified person, a non-parent, non-child, non-spouse, non-daughter, non-son-in-law, not yourself. It's like a bank, friend, hard money lender, neighbor, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin. And now you have 100 debt, 100 equity, just 50-50 debt to equity ratio, meaning if your property generates $20,000 in net income, 10,000, which is attributable to the debt, the 50-50 debt to equity ratio would be subject to the UBTI tax, which can go as high as 37% at approximately you know, 15 to 17,000 bucks. So it's a very low, low threshold. Um, there is an important exemption if you're a solo 401k or a 401k under section 514c9, there is an exemption to the UBTI tax if a 401k uses a non-recourse loan to acquire real estate. So a very important exception that applies if you can get into a solo K or a 401k. How do you get into a solo K? You don't need a full-time business. You just need side gig, Uber, uh, DoorDash, selling shoes on eBay, whatever it is. Um, whether you follow Schedule C or you have a C or S Corp, uh, just need to earn a little bit of income. And then you can establish a plan for that side business and acquire real estate by a rollover. And then if the real estate um, is acquired by a 401k using a non-recourse loan, there is no UBTI tax where that tax would apply to uh, IRA. So obviously that's super important. So let me just kind of expand on where we are from a leverage standpoint. Obviously, you know, <laughs> In December 22, it's not what it was in January uh, 2022, right? The mortgage rates for a 30-year loan, you know, they've gone up from like 4 to 7%. Um, investor loans, definitely more expensive. You're looking 10 to 12%, um, up from about 7 to 9%. So obviously, when money gets expensive, it's much harder to make money. We've been really blessed. I mean, we've lived on a low-interest gravy train for really since 08. We had some... Uh, Increases in rates, you know, periodically towards uh, before COVID a little bit, 1920, then again, uh, 2014 a little bit, 2012, but very mildly. Uh, we've really been uh, on a rocket ship of uh, very low cost fuel and low cost interest rates. And it's been a boom time, right? A lot of real estate investors I talk to, colleagues of mine, friends, they've never experienced an environment of higher interest rates. Never. So it's going to be interesting how they play their game, right? They just have never really had to address expensive money. Money's always been cheap. Maybe not as cheap as COVID, but cheap, really zero interest rate. So if you're a real estate developer and you can borrow tons of money at like three or 4%, a lot easier to make money than if you're borrowing at 10 or 12%. Okay. And that's what's going on now. But on top of that, landlords, you and me, we have added costs, right? We have inflation. We have costs, repairs maintenance. Um, we have all that stuff that we never really had to deal with, you know, pre-COVID and really pre-2022. COVID, we had difficulty maybe um, capturing certain um, types of hard materials or even potentially finding people to work. But now, you know, prices are just skyrocketing and a lot of businesses are just saying, well, there's inflation, so I'm just going to raise my prices. But in reality, labor costs are gone up. Basic materials have gone up, even though we're not in any type of, maybe not as 
uh, significant shortages of materials, but it's more of a labor crunch, which is causing contractors and uh, repair type businesses to increase their um, their fees because they're, they're paying more. So you got to do the math on the rental income. Okay, that's really super important. We all have to be better real estate investors today than we were over the last 10 years, right? You really have to pay attention to your business. Um, I think the goal is to kind of try to uh, generate about a 4% return. So if you're paying you know, $500,000 for the asset, you want to try to generate you know 20,000 bucks net after expenses. It's kind of the goal, right? So you need to um, really focus and, and try not to overestimate the benefits, right? Really consider um, potential unexpected vacancy, right? Assuming increased costs for repairs, you know, maybe you got to fix the plumbing or the pool, or you need a new roof or whatever it is. Like those costs are more than they were three, four, five years ago. Okay, it's not like a few hundred bucks is going to cover each month. You can't expect that. Okay, so we all need to be smarter um, landlords. We need to plan for uh, vacancies, plan for higher costs. Now, again, why am I in real estate with my IRA? Is because I think it's the best hedge against inflation. Why I can always rent, raise my rents next year, right? I have a one-year lease with my tenant, not a five-year lease, one-year lease. So unfortunately, if my costs go up seven, eight percent, I can raise the rent, you know, five, six, seven percent, assuming it's still a very strong labor market, which it is today. And there's plenty of opportunities to um, acquire a new tenant. So I'm super, I can sleep at night, right? I have also, you know, equities and cryptos and I'm very diversified, but my real estate investment is the one asset where I don't worry about it. Of course, I, I don't want anything tragic to happen. Like, you know, a hurricane to hit the house and the roof to collapse or flooding. But I mean, the chances of that are so minute. The biggest obstacles I have are like the toilet overflows or it's like the lights don't work or, you know, small stuff like that, which I have someone that handles that. And it's just something I price in, but um, I'm telling you, when my when the lease is up early 23, like the rent's going up. And that's the flexibility of being a landlord tenant. But you're not stuck into an investment generally for two, three, four years. Just raise the rent, right? Um, obviously, you don't want to raise it 40% and risk not having a tenant in there. But if your costs and expenses go up 7, 8, 10%, like you can always raise the rent 7, 8, 9, 10%. So you have that flexibility, which not a lot of uh, investments and assets um, can provide. So that's why I think just 23, uh, I know I'm just super more focused on expenses as a landlord than I than I ever was. You know, I've had this real estate in my IRA for many, many years, and it's always made some money, uh, done pretty well, but I, I've never really ran that investment like a business. Just been like, oh, okay, I got to pay this person to do that, or the landlord doesn't, the tenant doesn't want to pay a lot this year. Maybe I'll give them a break. Now it's like, no, like my expenses are up and uh, I can't lose money. So I need to raise rent a little bit. Unfortunately, my tenant's been in my space for a couple of years. I really like them, but like, hey, um, I'm going to have to raise rent because costs of servicing have gone up tremendously. I don't have any leverage on it. So I don't have to worry uh, about UBIT. Um, and obviously I'm not buying a house today, so I'm not really as focused on the cost of leverage, but especially for non IRA investors or even IRA investors using leverage, that is obviously what's slowing down you know, the real estate market. And that's what the Fed has been trying to do purposely is to tame the real estate market, which they're hoping will tame down inflation. They really believe that real estate is, is a heart of uh, a lot of this price increase. So their goal is, hey, if we increase interest rates, um, less free cash is gonna be more expensive to uh, transact real estate wise and home prices will drop and people will make less money and that's gonna kind of bring prices down uh, across the, the board. But you know, really there's still a lot of labor pressures, which uh, I'm, I'm not sure the Fed is, is even um, you know, trying to address. So if labor market's still, um, there's tightness in it, um, the shortages, like people are still gonna demand more money and that's gonna just put pressure on inflation. And, you know, the one thing that could, could solve it, and you know, it's definitely a hot button item, is immigration, right? I'm not saying just let people jump over a wall and get into this country, but we need to come up a way to bring in smart, educated people, give them a green card, maybe forget about the voting issue right now, give them green cards, uh, countries like India, Ukraine, 
uh, in parts of South America that have very talented people. Let's bring them in. I mean, we lost 2 million people to COVID. Let's just basically stop working, got out of the economy. We, we need to replace them. And that's going to, I think, uh, be the only thing that really dampens inflation is just bring more smart people into America that want to work and, and be productive and pay taxes. And um, I think that, that will take care of itself. But, you know, immigration is definitely a hot topic. And uh, you know, everyone looks to the wall, the border, the south, which, of course, no, no I came to this country from Canada. I did it the right way, right? I applied, I got a visa, went to law school in the United States. Like, I didn't just hop a fence. Um, so I agree, let's do it the right way, but let's let's bring in some smart people that could really help the labor market and um, you know, just get things back to normal. So um, all in all, I'm, I'm still super bullish on real estate. Um, I think 23 will be kind of uh, up and down year, but if you are owning real estate in an IRA or thinking of buying it, you know, definitely, you're going to need to be more focused on expenses in 23. You have some flexibility in, in rent increases, but plan for you know maybe a couple of months on having a tenant, right? If you're going to raise your rent, plan on increased expenses and costs. If you're trying to get a loan to buy real estate in an IRA, expect 30, 40, 50% down. If you're not using an IRA, you can do 20%, but you're really going to have to run the numbers because it's not a, a four or 5% mortgage anymore. It's like a seven, eight, 9% mortgage, which um, definitely is, is not as enjoyable uh, to pay and, and doesn't make a lot of real estate deals uh, worthwhile. And that's why a lot of people are just really on the sidelines today. So I think that will change. I think by second, third quarter, 23, we're gonna, um, I think rates will pause, maybe, I don't know, come down, but I think the Fed will stop increasing rates and I think the real estate market will stabilize. So uh, maybe just sit tight on the sidelines for a bit. But if you are a current IRA, um, you know, landlord, then definitely like focus. Um, it's going to be tough to make money in 23. Um, so really pay attention to the bottom line. And that's today's episode. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, today's podcast. I really appreciate you guys spending some time here today. I know it's uh, Christmas, and Hanukkah, and New Year's, and a lot of good stuff to do. But I think it's an important topic because um, it is going to be harder to make money as a landlord. But there are ways if you stay on top of your numbers and really treat it as a business, not just a casual hobby. Uh, I think that can make the difference to get you really at that 4% sweet spot where you want to net income 4% of what you paid for it and have that compound without tax. So I um, want to wish everyone happy holidays, uh, happy early new year. I hope everyone has uh, the opportunity to spend a lot of time with family and friends and relax. And, um, looking forward to a great 2023. So. Take care, be well, and I'll talk to everyone again uh, next week. Take care.